You're about to discover nine essential tips if you're planning to go cruising in a post-shutdown world. I'm Gary Bemidge. This is another of my cruising tips for travelers. I want to share with you nine things that I think you should think about, plan, and do if you're planning to go cruising in a post-shutdown world, whether that's as soon as cruising starts or heading right back into 2021 or even later than that. These are things that I really think you need to think about, plan for, and prepare for, starting with this one. Embrace the volatility, book late, and retain flexibility. Why do I say that? As we head into cruising, we should assume that things are going to be volatile for a while. No one really knows finally what, how many ports are going to open, how many ships they're going to want to take at any time, and how much traditional itineraries are going to be able to run. As cruising gets back into its stride and as they start to confirm cruises and start to run cruises, some of that will settle down. But there's a lot of volatility out there, a lot of uncertainty around there, a lot of worries out there. And so there will be much more capacity than perhaps even existing bookings show because a lot of people who would have booked a long time ago still have a long time to make up their mind. You know, you pay 90 days, 60 days before. I think a lot of people will drop out. I think there'll be lots of late minute capacity coming on board and lots of uncertainty around the way things are going to be. No one really knows what the procedures are going to be, what the rules and regulations uh, of getting to a ship are going to be, boarding the ship, what's going to happen on the ship. So there's lots and lots of uncertainty and there's going to be a lot of volatility in prices and availability. So actually, my big tip if you're planning to go cruising is retain flexibility and be able to make decisions much later and closer to when cruises go and be able to take advantage of knowing exactly what the final itinerary is going to be, what the ports are going to be, and actually work the system to find phenomenal deals. Bear in mind, if you book a cruise now in a broad area, the cruise line within the cruise contract can change the ports that you go to. So the cruise you think you're booking may not happen. You may still go around the Med or the Caribbean or wherever that may be, but the actual ports may change quite dramatically and quite significantly. So by basically holding back, retaining flexibility, making sure you're ready to go, pencil out when you want to go, and work the whole system as deals come up. Wait until cruises are actually up and running before you make any decisions. My second real tip for cruising in a post-shutdown world is stay local. And I say that for a couple of reasons, one of which is a practical reason in that it's going to be much easier to get to the ports it also appears as travel gets up and running, there may be lots of challenges even with airports and airlines. We don't know what the whole process but that's going to be. It could be more expensive, for example, to travel and much less availability. So actually staying more local could be a really good idea because that takes one less hassle out of traveling to your cruise. It's also going to be an area that you know well, understand well. You probably understand how the governments work there, how the system works there. You're not that far from home. So that could provide extra reassurance if anything does happen. One of the big challenges in the pre-shutdown world is a lot of people were very far away from home in very exotic locations, but it was quite complex and difficult to eventually get home. They didn't know the system. They didn't know where the things worked. So actually staying local is a really good idea. So if you actually one of those people that can drive or train or take a short flight to get to a cruise, that might be a good idea. So for example, if you're based in the US, sort of in Florida or New York or places like that, which do the Caribbean, you may want to stick to the Caribbean. If you're in Europe, you, you may want to stick to around the UK or cruises that go in a certain region like Northern Europe, the Norwegian fjords, wherever that is. So kind of close and local to home could be a really good idea as you head back and try out cruising once again. The other thing that may happen certainly in the early phases of a post-shutdown world is lots of countries are talking about creating these travel bubbles. So for example, there's been lots of talk of Australia and New Zealand forming a kind of a travel bubble before international travel comes. There's been some talk, for example, in Europe of places like Greece and Croatia forming like a travel bubble to enable people to move more easily between them. So you might also find actually staying more local or staying within those bubbles becomes particularly appealing, certainly in the early stages of the end of shutdown. My third tip is another one that I think is really important about the way that you approach cruising differently. Now, you might have been one of those people that love going on small ships, or you might have been one of those people who like the big mega resort ships with really funky and wild things like ice skating rinks and go-kart tracks and rock climbing walls, all that kind of stuff. But one of the things I really recommend you think about is as you head back into cruising in a post-lockdown, post-shutdown world is think a lot about the type of cruise ship that you want to be on. One of the things we're becoming more and more used to is the concept of social distancing, which may or may not exist in any form moving forwards. But we're getting more used to having 
more control over our space being further apart from people. So you might want to think about what type of ship do you want to be on? Do you want to be on a ship that has lots and lots of deck space so you know that you're going to be able to spread out, there's going to be lots of space? Are you going to want to be on a cruise ship which has a very high passenger to space ratio, which has big rooms? So for example, Queen Mary 2 has a very high space per passenger ratio. So you might want to think about the type of ship you want to be on. Or you want to be on a ship that has much fewer passengers than you used to in the past. So you want to look at an Oceania and Azamara, those small ships, you know, with a couple of hundred passengers. So think around the type of experience that you're going to feel most comfortable in. Of course, we also need to understand how the whole onboard experience is going to operate and be the same or different. But just think about the type of environment you want to be in. This may be even more important than the type of facilities than it was in the past. So think about the process of deciding which type of ship you want to be on and that whole experience of the ship and the things that are important to you because you may find space and fewer passengers is more important than the attractions were perhaps in the past. My fourth tip is around the cabin. Many, many people that I know like to go in an inside cabin. It's inexpensive and it means that they can go cruising more often. But do have a think around as you head back into cruising in a post shutdown world, what type of cabin do you want to be in? We heard many stories, for example, in the ships that were quarantined pre the whole shutdown lockdown of people who were then in inside cabins and kind of small cabins without any light and fresh air. And that was kind of really frustrating for them. You might want to think moving forward back into cruising. Do you want to be perhaps a little bit more cautious? I think we'll probably find that the processes and the procedures are going to be really, really strict. So hopefully it never gets to that situation again. But do think about the type of cabin you do want to be in. Do you want to actually reassure yourself by going in, for example, a balcony cabin, which is slightly bigger than you perhaps might have gone before, but you know that you've got the outside space. The reason I say that is you also might find as we head back cruising, after we're so used to the social distancing and lockdown, that you actually value your own space much more. And instead of perhaps going and hang out in public spaces, you might actually want the ability to go out and sit on your balcony much more. So just think around the kind of cruising experience you're going to want. And are you going to want to have much more of your own personal space with light and air to actually enjoy? And I think that's going to be a big trend personally. A lot of people are going to be looking increasingly at balcony cabins moving forwards. Another really important area is around the whole payment and cancellation terms. What we have got increasingly used to through this whole process of the shutdown is cruise lines introducing much more flexible cancellation policies. However, when you look forwards, they seem to be bringing back the stricter 90 days, 60 days payments, high percentage of cancellations. Now, there have been a couple of developments recently as a time I video of this with, for example, the Royal Caribbean Group actually extending their much more flexible cancellation right into next year, into 2021. And we might see more of that. But when you start planning to go back cruising, really think about how far ahead you want to commit to and what the cancellation terms are. So look even more than you ever did before about what is the payment time that you have to make before you go on a cruise and what are the cancellation options should you change your mind. I think we may find more and more flexibility coming in because people have got used to it and also to encourage people back. Also really importantly is wait and understand what the whole procedures are. As we know, in the pre-shutdown world, if you declared on the health declaration form that you were vomiting or had an upset stomach, you would often be quarantined in your cabin. You wouldn't have any options of cancelling. So it did actually encourage people who perhaps went 100% well to go on cruises. So also understand and wait, I think, to understand what the process is. So if you're not feeling well, quite close to the cruise, are they going to give you a way of cancelling and getting refunds or future cruise credit? And if you are through the new processes denied boarding, what is the refund and cancellation process? So make sure that you understand what that is. And I actually think it's worth waiting to see how that all settles down before you really start committing to cruising and a lot of money in a post shutdown world. Linked to that, one of the things that I think is really important if you are planning going cruising in a post shutdown world, and certainly for the next year or two, is travel insurance. What we're seeing in most places in all the policies I've seen and the discussions I've seen is most insurance companies are excluding any claims related to COVID-19. So if you head out on a cruise or you need to cancel a cruise for any reason linked to COVID-19, insurance won't pay out and they'll tell you that you need to look at either the cruise line or the airline or whatever. So as you plan to go back cruising, really understand what travel insurance that you can get because if you do have to cancel or you have some problem which might be not related to even to COVID-19 or you do have some sort of COVID-19 related issue, will that policy pay out or will it actually be just not valid at all. 
Cruising without travel insurance is a really bad idea because some of the co costs not related to the pandemic can be enormous if you fall ill, end up having to go to hospital in a foreign country or you can get medevaced. So really, really understand before you commit to cruising in a post-shutdown world that you understand what travel insurance you can get and what it will cover. My other big tip and watch out for cruising in a post-shutdown world is fares. I do believe that we're going to see lots and lots of deals, which is why I said retain flexibility. But even more importantly, I think fares will be quite volatile for quite some time as supply and demand, particularly demand, wanes over time. So I think we're going to see lots and lots of deals coming along. What's really important is once you've booked your cruise, particularly if you've booked it far ahead, keep an eye on the fares. If the fares drop and you approach the cruise line, they will normally give you something to compensate. They'll either upgrade you to a better cabin or they'll give you extra on board credit or they'll give you future cruise credit. Really, really important because I do think fares are going to be volatile. I do think the trend might be downwards. So do focus a lot on tracking your fare either through your travel agent or do it yourself. Now, some of the cruise lines are already starting to acknowledge this. So again, I've seen some recent developments from Royal Caribbean Group, which do acknowledge that if fares do go down in the next year or so, they will be willing, if you contact them, to give you some extra benefits. But the important thing is you need to track it and you need to approach the cruise line. My next point is around budgeting. So when you're budgeting for your cruise, think door to door. I've seen a lot of studies where various market trackers have said that on average, cruisers will spend between 50% and 100% of their fare once they're on board. So there's that whole bunch of costs. But also very importantly, there's a lot of costs associated with getting to the cruise. We know that there's lots of volatility and uncertainty around airlines. We don't know how many are going to survive. We don't know what the costs are going to be based on the restrictions. So we might find airfares going up. So the cost of getting to your cruise becomes more expensive. We might find that the onboard costs. So there's a whole bunch of onboard costs you need to really bear in mind. So you've got gratuities, which often get auto added, could add two, three hundred dollars to your cruise per person, even across seven days. You've got Wi-Fi, which can be pretty expensive. Again, that could be another couple of hundred dollars if you use Wi-Fi. You've got drinks. Drinks packages can be pretty expensive. I actually recommend you kind of avoid drinks packages and buy drinks individually as a way of controlling costs. You have specialty dining that can add a lot of costs and excursions. You know, you can be spending many hundreds of dollars on excursions, particularly if you've got a port intensive cruise. So as you start to budget, keep a real eye out for whether those costs are going up. I think there's a chance, of course, they may be pushing those up because the model of a cruise line is get people onto the cruise as cheaply as possible and then try and make as much money as possible on the cruise. You might find many of those costs going up and then the whole process, of course, of getting home. So really look at the whole budget. So don't be just drawn by cheap entry fares because the overall cost of cruising could actually be increasing. So really budget really carefully and understand. One of the ways, of course, of mitigating against it, and we're seeing a lot of those deals at the moment, is quite a few cruise lines are offering a fare where they'll bundle in some of those extras. So gratuities, Wi-Fi, drinks, that kind of stuff. So that may be something to really focus on to help manage your overall cost. So a big tip of mine is look for those deals and you know focus on trying to tie those down to manage your budget. Of course, you could also look at some of the lines which throw more of those in. So for example, Virgin Voyages has more stuff included. Oceania, they have their Olaf where you can pick those different things. And I've seen quite a few deals coming through from Holland America, Celebrity, Princess, where they are offering bundling much more into the fair. Another really important tip that I have for cruising in a post-shutdown world is, even if you haven't done it before, think of actually working with a cruise travel agent. So a lot of people like me, historically, I've liked to sort of put my own packages together, you know, book my airfare in one place, book my own hotels, book my flights, book my cruise, my transfers, all kind of separately. However, moving forward, you might want to do that through an agent. It means you have one point of contact. So if anything goes wrong, if there's any of this volatility or things change, you only have one call to make, one email to make, and they will sort it all out. And if you are actually out on a cruise and there's a problem, you have one person who can then sort everything out for you. Those are the things I think you need to really focus on heading out back cruising in a post-shutdown world. Hope you found that helpful. I have loads more videos packed full of tips and advice on cruising. So why don't you watch another one of those right now?